Okay, by my clock, it's uh, just two and twelve thirty, so we'll get underway. Um, for those of you that uh, I haven't met before, my name's Greg Shepherd. Uh, I facilitate the Marlborough Beef and Lamb Farming for Profit program, of which this uh, webinar uh, focusing on uh, optimising lambing performance is uh, our topic today. Um, firstly, I'd like you like to welcome you all here, uh, and take uh, the opportunity to acknowledge our uh, program funder, being Beef and Lamb New Zealand, and um, I'll mention his name now, Paul Kenyon, uh, who is our guest speaker. Um, and I guess really, uh, by way of a bit of a background, who is Paul Kenyon? Uh, Paul is a, uh, a doctor at Massey University. Um, he completed his agricultural science degree in 1996 uh, and PhD in animal science in 2002. He's currently the head of School of Agriculture and Environment at Massey University and with uh, more than 20 years experience in sheep research in New Zealand and internationally. Um, he's been involved in a number of uh, large research programs which he's either led or been part of, um, including looking at maximising ewe lamb, being hogget, breeding formants, the management of twin and triplet ewe and their offspring in pregnancy and lactation, developing ewe body condition score guidelines, uh, using alternative herbages, uh, to improve sheep performance, uh, also looking at uh, sheep interactions with waterways and the impacts of sheep grazing on nitrate levels uh, and helping with farmer learning. So we're very fortunate to have uh, Paul with us this afternoon. So I guess without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Paul, and, and um, we look forward to um, hearing what it is uh, that you've got to say about um, how we go about optimising uh, lambing performance. So it's all yours, Paul. Thanks, Greg. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for um, coming in uh, to listen to us today. So I'm assuming we'll um, start with the fact that for most of you, it will be about mid-pregnancy on your farms. Many of you will have covers below what would normally be ideal. And maybe some of you might have already started to uh, reduce the numbers of stock on your farms. Now, all of those things um, will impact on how you can manage your ewe flock from now to lambing. And I'm going to concentrate on the mature ewes, but most of the principles hold um, that we talk about today on mature ewes will hold for ewe lambs or as well, but there are some specific differences. So if we assume, and I'm, I'm correct in assuming most of you use, will, for most of your flocks will be around mid-pregnancy. Um, you'll either be just starting to pregnancy scan, or you might have been pregnancy scan or scanned already, or if you're lambing more in September, which the odd farmer might be um, still, um, you may not have scanned yet your mature use. And I note that, um, it was pretty well split between those who scanned for fetal age and those who didn't 50-50. Now, the advantage of uh, scanning for fetal age comes down to being able to make informed decisions on your feeding of your ewes, especially when you've had the ram out for more than two cycles. Now, some of you, of course, may be choosing not to fetal scan because you use mating harnesses on your rams anyway and therefore you can easily identify those ewes that are your second and third cycle uh, ewes or your later lambing ewes. But if you don't um, use those harnesses anymore then fetal scanning especially when you're in a situation where pasture covers are low um, and your ewes may also be in poor condition because of the carryover effect of, of a hard summer. Fetal scanning does give you more information. And information is key to being able to make informed decisions. And the, the reason that's important is because to be, it's about being able to target the feeding of your ewes that need it most. Now, when your pasture covers are low, um, you're gonna have those ewes that need feed now um, in mid to late pregnancy versus those that, that can handle being uh, held back for a period of time and being offered uh, more feed later on. 
Now, of course, if you've bred for more than two cycles or even two cycles, when, when it comes to late pregnancy for your uh, first cycle ewes, so let, let's pretend that at a day 130 of pregnancy where their feeding demand really cranks up, they're at day 130, the first ewes at a lambing that were bred on the first day. But those that were bred at the second day are really at, at, sorry, in the second cycle only. The earliest they can be in pregnancy is day 113, um, because the, the reproductive cycle of the sheep is 17 days. So at day 113, the feed demand of a ewe is quite a lot less than day 130. And those are in the third cycle, and many of you indicated that you um, bred for 34 to 57 days. And, well, then some of those ewes, who those are the third cycle ewes, some of them are only 96 days pregnant or less. And they can pretty much be pushed back still at a really maintenance level of, of feeding. Um, while those ewes that are lambing the first cycle, those ewes that are somewhere between 34 to 51 days more pregnant, um, can be offered the extra feed that, that you do have. So pregnancy scanning allows you to target the ewes that need it most. Um, when it comes to those last few weeks before your lambing starts. You know, in the paddock, the, the ewe that's gonna lamb um, 51 days later never says to the ewe that's gonna lamb first, you eat it, uh, you need it. I don't, that doesn't occur. And so it's about being able to target the feed you have to those that need it the most. And remember, if you've timed your lambing correctly so that lambing occurs just as your levels of pasture start to come away, those third cycle ewes, and even some of those latest second cycle ewes, their late pregnancy will be coinciding when pasture covers are coming up. Grass growth is increasing. So when they need it most, that late, very late, last two or three weeks of pregnancy and lactation, the grass is really starting to kick along and grow. And so therefore you need to be less worried about them. And it's the ones you need to be worried about the most are those that are lambing first cycle. So when it comes to talking about uh, feeding of ewes in mid to late pregnancy, it's about a hierarchy of demand, those that need it the most. And it's about splitting your mob up a bit into two or three uh, groups. And, and those groups should be based on demand. So those that need it the most, in mid to late pregnancy are your first cycle multiple bearing use, especially those in poor condition. Because in the last 30 or so days of pregnancy, a ewe physically can't put on condition and she needs that fat to buffer against the fact that even if you do feed her ad libitum or unrestricted in the last week or two of pregnancy and early lactation, she physically can't eat enough if she's carrying twins or triplets. So she needs that fat. So in mid pregnancy post uh, scanning, Really, it's your poor condition, first cycle use at a multiple berry that the ones at the very least you should be giving the most feed to. The next, the next group or your second category group are your rest of your multiple bearing first cycle use. And then the third or fourth group, depending on how comfortable we are splitting your use up, uh, your third group would be your um, later lambing, so second and third cycle mature use uh, that are multiple bearing, and then your Fourth group are uh, your single bearing use. You can push quite hard. Uh, for those of you who've been around farming for a long time, you know, when we only had singles, we know you used to push them quite hard and you had a hot, lot, lot higher stocking rate on many of your farms. So you can, they can be your fourth group, but on most farms, farmers are only comfortable with two or three groups. So if you've got two groups, it'll be your poor condition, multiple bearing first um, cycle use, those with body condition score two, or let, two and a half or less, they should be your priority group. And then all your other use and your truck and trailer type response group, they're following that first group around. If you're comfortable with having three mobs of use, then I would advocate your poor condition, multiple bearing use, uh, first cycle in one mob, followed by the rest of your first cycle, better condition, multiple bearing use. And then your third group are your, uh, are your late lambing use and your singleton bearing use. They would be how I would manage my use in, in mid to late pregnancy. And therefore, as much data you can get at scanning, if you haven't scanned um, it yet, is, is important. And so at scanning, um, you would be marking them on their back somewhere if they're dry single twin or triplet or dry single multiple, which is what most of you will do. 
you're putting your hand on them anyway just to push them to give them a bit of love to get on that crate if they feel real skinny when you're doing that then just put an extra mark maybe somewhere else on the body to indicate they are real skinny use and or, or, or double spray mark them you know if it's if it's red for for triplet give her two reds you know or if it's green for twin two greens so you know that she's a thin you and, and they can be that that priority mob of 10 or 15 percent use which are your first mob so you've identified them as they're your multiple berry they are hopefully first cycle and and they're poor condition they're the ones that's and that's what you should be doing with your scanning data um, so that you know exactly which use are under, under most pressure and when you haven't got enough feed which many of you won't have because of coming out of a, a poor summer it's that first priority group poor condition multiple bearing first cycle use are the ones at the very least you want to give the extra feed to because we know that if you underfeed you in mid to late pregnancy birth weight the lambs will be down the yeah, brown adipose fat levels will be down which means their ability to produce body heat will be down um, their vigour and their drive to get up and suckle and bond with mum will be down. Mum, if she's in poor condition, will be driven to, to get up and eat rather than bond. And that's a real problem if you've got multiples, if she's not spending time with each of them to bond properly. She will uh, produce less colostrum. It'll be of poorer quality. And the total milk yield that she produces in lactation uh, will be down. And remember, you are dairy farmers. You know, all your money now there may be the odd merino farmer on, I'm not sure, on this presentation, but for those of you that aren't, you're really dairy farmers. All your money comes from selling lamb. Your most efficient lamb is one that's sold straight off mum to slaughter. You only get that if she's producing a heap of milk. Therefore, your money comes from milk. So you're milk farmers, you're dairy farmers. And we know that if she's in poor condition, poorly fed, she'll produce less milk, just like any dairy cattle farmer will tell you. And therefore, she'll wean less lambs. And those individual lambs will be lighter, which means they'll take more feed to get them to slaughter weights, which is inefficient. So all of those things come together to tell you that we want uh, to minimise the number of ewes that are poorly fed and in poor condition coming into pregnancy and lactation. So in mid-pregnancy, uh, you want to be lifting the pasture covers a little bit um, of, of those poor condition multiples. And that might be um, only grazing down to 900 in that group, whereas the other group or groups, depending on how comfortable we are to have um, other groups on our rotation, would be following them and would be grazing a lot lower. And as Greg just said, that you know, 70 to 80% of your lamb, your income comes now from lamb, so you're milk farmers. So it's about managing your use to maximise the milk. So that's what you need to be doing in, in mid pregnancy. So and of Paul, course, I'm, sorry, Paul, I just want to interrupt there for a moment if I can. Um, just remind everybody, if you do have a question about what uh, about something that Paul said, please use that chat function. Um, one for you, Paul, I put up there, what about use of concentrates, um, sheep nuts or something like that through pregnancy? You talked about, um, you know, in that um, certainly the last um, part of the last 30 days of uh, pregnancy, you can't put weight on um, yep. those ewes. Can you do so with, with sheep nuts or, or the like? Um. So first thing, you know, in mid-pregnancy, um, you could, I wouldn't use the, the, the sheep nuts. Um, if for those of you who have a uh, winter forage crop, which might be brassica based, you know, it's a good time to, to, to use that. Um, however, try to avoid using those brassica type, especially the bulb brassicas, in the last three weeks of gestation because the bulb uh, and the stalk is predominantly water. You know, it's 90% water and therefore you might think you're feeding them well, but you're just filling them full of water. Um, give an example, if, if a ewe was eating brassica bulb only, say a, a, a turnip bulb only, to get three kilograms of dry matter, she'd have to eat 30 kilos of bulb, um, which is like a wool barrel full because it's 90% water. Um, in terms of uh, the concentrates, yes, you can use them in the last few weeks, Greg. Um, the, the issues there are getting them onto them, but maybe in your environment down there, many of you, your sheep are trained to using them. Um, so then it comes down to, to utilisation. Um, rather than putting weight on, um, they have been shown to be good in, in triplet bearing use and in very poor condition twin bearing use to, to try to get the, the land birth weights up to that top optimal range and try to ensure that colostrum production is up. You probably won't put condition on the ewe, but you'll limit how much she loses. So rather than putting condition on, 
you're limiting how much she loses, which is really a good situation because then she's still got that condition to use in those first couple of weeks post lambing where she physically can't eat enough. So that, that's where they could be used, Greg. Um, then. In terms of, I just want to go back to uh, mid-pregnancy, some of you, um, actually a large percentage, you 70% of those that did the survey um, indicated your mid-pregnancy sharing, um, which is a tool to increase uh, lamb survival by a couple of percentage points. There's no doubt at all it can do that, but it can only do that under a couple of such uh, scenarios. The mid-pregnancy sharing, if you're sharing a mid-pregnancy, which is somewhere between day 40 of pregnancy and day 100, so after scanning, um, that increases birth weight because what happens if, as you share the ewe, she feels cold. And if you think about a day like today, she'll feel cold, go out into the... And, it, and when she feels cold, she speeds up her metabolism like you would, and you break down your body fat like you would if we were to chuck you outside today naked. Um, and that breaking down of her body fat means there's more energy in your blood system and it crosses the placenta and enhances placental growth and fetal growth to get bigger, bigger lambs. So you want that in twins. So the mid-pregnancy sharing response from lamb survival only really occurs in twins, it's point one. Secondly, it only will occur if the ewe has got some body reserves or body fat to partition when she feels cold. So if she's already thin, you won't get that increased fetal growth and you won't get the bigger lamb, so you won't get the increased lamb survival. And of course, it's only really in multiples, twin bearing use, and not singletons, that you want to increase lamb birth weight. So if you're in a situation where your covers are low, and we do know that if you share a ewe, she might increase her intake a little bit for a couple of weeks, you might think about limiting the number of ewes you might choose to mid pregnancy share to one, limit your costs, uh, two, to, uh, to maximise the chance of getting a response from a lamb survival point of view, and thirdly, limit how much extra grass they eat I would only mid pregnancy share in a year like this if uh, you use twin bearing or triple bearing and a good body condition. So, if you're comfortable with having uh, only sharing a proportion of your U flock, and therefore when you come to your second sharing post Christmas, having two wool lengths, um, that's what I'd do to minimise cost and maximise your chance of getting the output that, that, that you want in terms of increased lamb survival. If you're late pregnancy sharing, which is after day 100, so that's in the last month and a half before lambing starts, you'll only really get a response from, uh, from lamb survival point of view. It's too late to change fetal growth trajectory. You're actually about um, making her feel cold still around lambing, and so she seeks shelter. If you share it, you at day 70 or 80, um, using the cover comb, which you're required to do, or the snow comb, or the winter comb, um, the time she lambs 70 days later, she'll actually grow in enough wool stubble um, that she won't feel the cold and seek shelter. So mid pregnancy and late pregnancy shearing are two different mechanisms to uh, change lamb survival. Okay, are there, are there any questions we want to cover now, Rhiannon, before I talk about very late pregnancy uh, feeding? Oh, we've got none, none through yet, Paul. Okay, that's all right. Um, sorry, look, Paul, sorry, I did get one, uh, or a couple actually posted to me uh, directly, so I'll share those with you now. Firstly, most of this advice assumes rye grass or similar forage. Forage yep. cereals can be used all the way through uh, for, or best to finish prior to start of lactation. Um, firstly, any, any comments on that? Yeah, no, that's, that, that's right, that's right. Um, so th there are a number of herbages that you could use, you know, and if you're warm enough and you've still got things like plantain clovers growing, you can use them um, in some bits of the country, right, almost through to, to set stocking. Um, and you can use those those winter um, herbages you touched on there, Greg, as well. Um, okay. But you just need to be a bit careful with any change in diet um, in the last couple of weeks of pregnancy. In terms of a rapid change, because remember that the rumen is just full of millions of bacteria of many different types. And depending on what forage the animal is eating, uh, certain bacteria dominate or proliferate. And so if you suddenly change a feed, you've got the wrong mix of bacteria and they get what we'd call a gut ache and they get, can go off their feed a bit. And that's the last thing you want to do in the last couple of weeks before lambing. So I totally agree. There's lots of different 
uh, forages or, or, or feeds you could use. It's not just about grass and clover. In reality, we don't, shouldn't really say ryegrass, white clover, because most of you have only a small bit of clover and we overplay how much ryegrass is actually in our grasses. Um, but it's about, if you are on any of those alternative herbages, adjusting slowly off them. Don't just finish that alternative herbage type and go straight on to a grass-based diet um, because you run the risk of putting them into um, metabolic disorder and getting sleepy and, and uh, twin lamb disease. So they're good feeds, but just adjust them on and off. Okay, so look, Paul, you probably um, address this next part of the, the question from this person. If drought-induced, ewes have had grain for duration of mating and early pregnancy, and hill country pastures are dominated by low digestibility annual grass species, should grain feeding be stopped? If so, when? Are all pastures the same as ryegrass? So, look, um, you may have already answered some of that. Yeah, no, I... The, the principles are the same. If, you know, if different grasses have different advantages in terms of ME, uh, the amount of protein and, and, and the uh, fibre content. Um, if you use adapted to it and you've slightly adapted them in and you're not giving them huge amounts, um, then there's no disadvantage about giving them some in, in, in that mid to late uh, pregnancy period. As long as you avoid grain overload and as long as you avoid something coming off it. So I've kind of covered that, I think, Greg. Yep. Okay, look, we've got a couple of other questions that have come through. Um, yeah, what about sharing uh, early in pregnancy pre-scanning? Yep, yep. So there's... Possibly you've touched. Yeah, yeah. So, so the earliest anyone's ever recorded uh, an increase in birth weight lamb survival is uh, about 35 days after... Uh, the, the, the fetal age of 35 days. So... If you are, um, most of your ewes are mated in the first cycle, which most farms are, 70 80%, then there's no, then sharing pre uh, pregnancy scanning is fine just before then because the vast majority of your ewes will, will be more than 35 days pregnant. So it'll still be effective. Yep. Just that okay. your second cycle and third cycle ewes may not be effective, but they're only a small percentage of your flock. Okay, another question, Paul. And we've got uh, so we would like to know about early pregnancy around 35 days and risk of the benefits. I guess we've just um, heard you talk about that. Um, what are your thoughts on pre lamb drenching to increase lamb survival and growth rate? So <laughs> that's a bit of a hospital pass, Greg. Um, so, and I'm, I'm not sure what they mean by pre lamb drenching. If, if they're meaning for anthelmintic reasons, well, then you're best to determine if you've got a parasite load issue um, first, rather than just blanket drenching for the sake of blanket drenching. Um, because either you, if you're just drenching for the sake of it, uh, you might be wasting your money um, in terms of there's not a parasite load. Or secondly, drenching for the sake of it can, as we all know for a while now, um, speed up drench resistance. So you be a bit careful there. Um, if they're talking about pre-lamb drenching from a lamb survival from a mineral deficiency perspective, it'll very much depend on whether or not you've got a deficiency on your farm of a given mineral or type. So that's actually um, not an easy uh, question to answer because both of those will be dependent on the current situation and really in a perfect world, and I'm not a veterinarian trying to sell you anything, um, you're best to, you know, you can quickly do a parasite uh, count on your use by pushing them in a corner of a paddock just a few days out from when you might want to drench them and just grab some fresh warm poo when they when you leave when they leave that corner and get a count done, and you can um, get, get a mineral analysis um, from some animals. Get your veterinarian out for that. So it really is a dependent on what your situation is. So it's not an easy answer to give. Sorry. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Uh, um, what I should have said at the start too it was remiss of me. Most of you, you know, know now your gut feeling about where you are. So yes, you should know what uh, your ewes are carrying in terms of single twin triplets. You should know their body condition score. Ideally, you'd know whether they're early or late lambing. And then really you should be in your own mind, most of you've been on your farms long enough to, to have a gut feeling, am I in the crap or not? And then depending on what that gut feeling is, is how quickly you, you make some decisions. Now, those decisions might be bringing in supplement. We talked about that, but equally those decisions might be as hard as they are, selling some animals or sending some animals away. Um, in terms of grazing 
to, to, to ensure the ones you have got on farm uh, are, are fed at a level that they need to be in late pregnancy. Otherwise, if you have too much demand on your farm and your covers just get too low and uh, a long way off the ideal of, ideal of somewhere around 11 to 1,200 lambing, you will have uh, a lot of dead lambs. You'll end up with a low uh, weaning percentage. You'll end up with um, lighter lambs, um, which will take more feeding. And you'll end up with poorer condition use. And if you're in that cycle of going into another summer, it just means you're setting up the next year to have thinner ewes going into breeding and your ovulation rate, and therefore your scanning percent next year will be below optimum. So there are a few decisions you, sh you, you need to make in terms of uh, also about stock numbers and um, as, as, well of, as well as just using supplement, whether it's buying in or, or stuff you've grown on farm or stuff you might have harvested if you're lucky enough to have grown excess over summer autumn. Um, so then it comes to late pregnancy. Now, in late pregnancy, in a perfect world, from day, um, from three weeks out from lambing, a use, use allowance should be well above two kilograms of dry matter per day, closer towards four kilograms, so that she can actually eat over two kilograms. Because in those last couple of week, weeks, the, each individual fetus, and if she's carrying twins or triplets, is growing at about 100 grams per day. And she's putting on, that's for each fetus, and she's also putting on water as well in terms of you know, what, what's in the, in, the, in the bag or the placenta, um, and, you know, the water bag. Um, so that's a huge amount of weight going on. So in the last two to three weeks, um, you're really in a perfect world and you're not in a perfect world and most of our farms are never in a perfect world because we're trying to lamb as early as we can in spring to maximise the, the number of days our lambs have got to grow so that we get many as lambs as possible away pre-Christmas. In a perfect world, you'd be lambing at um, 1,200 kilograms of dry matter, which I know that many of you are off, well off. So um, based on that hierarchy I talked about before, and we may not get to my slides, but I'll send them to Greg and they can be sent around as PDFs. Um, you, you, you would be um, ensuring that, that your twin bearing ewes, your poor condition twin and triple bearing ewes in those last few weeks are not really grazing below that 12 or 1300 um, kilograms of dry matter. Now someone asked uh, uh, the obvious question about bearings. Bearings is a, any speaker's uh, nightmare and a career killer because any advice you give on bearings will be wrong. Um, bearings, no one knows what causes bearings. You know, the, the, there was a study done in the late 90s, early 2000 with 300,000 ewes enrolled in across New Zealand and not many clear guidelines came. Um, the only clear guidelines came and there, there were some breeds were more or less likely to give bearings and uh, some environments are more or less likely to give them bearings. Um, but around feeding, there, there was not a, not a lot of clear guidelines. It is true, you, you don't want to blow the ewes out, and I totally accept that. And so therefore, hopefully, as I said to you, if you've started mid-pregnancy, by having two or three uh, groups of ewes in your rotation based on demand, those uh, poor condition twin and triple bearing ewes were the ones you're always feeding slightly more all the way through, making sure that they were putting on condition. And so when you got to late pregnancy, increasing them slightly is not going from feast to famine. So you're not suddenly going to blow them out. Um, sorry if I didn't make that very clear. So you're, what I'm meaning is you're slowly increasing their feed demand. And by the time you get to that last two to three weeks, that's when those kind of minima are, are required. I'm not at all saying keep everything on maintenance to two to three weeks out um, and then suddenly feed them a lot more. So from about day 100, those priority ewes shouldn't be grazing below 900. You're slowly increasing the post-grazing mass. Now, if you've got no feed and you've got a lot of single bearing ewes and late lambing ewes, they can still be pushed a bit later because they will not be in that 100 to 132 days. They are 17 or 34 days further back, okay? But then your first lambing group of ewes, so your first cycle ewes, when they first get two to three weeks out from lambing, you've slowly increased your allowance to be up two and a half to, to four kilograms per day. And as I said, there's not gonna be enough grass on your farms to do that for the use. So it's about prioritizing which ones get it. And in a perfect world, two, three we two weeks out from lambing, you don't re restrict feed intake, which in a perfect world means you don't graze below 1200. Um, 
and that's three to four kilograms. And you don't, and this is a ridiculous point to make, but grazing above 1800, they actually don't eat anymore. So as long as you're not grazing out to 1200 for your, for your most important use, if you have it, you're not restricting intake. So in a sheep, if you're not grazing below 1200, you're never restricting intake because they're the size of their mouth. There's only so many, so much they can put in their gob in one time and they've uh, got to uh, regurgitate and ruminate on it. But do remember, even when you're only grazing down to 1,200, even we, we're not meeting their requirements. We have, in the last 30 years, created use by going for twins and triplets and going for increased lamb growth that, based on pasture, can't meet their theoretical requirements. They physically can't. And so that's why you need to have that extra fat or body condition going into late pregnancy lactation. Like any dairy cattle farmer will tell you, they'll tell you what their target should be. And in an ideal world, your ewes should have a minimum body condition score of three out of five. And the reason that I come up with those uh, targets is not, I didn't pluck them out of the air. Um, they're based on work that was done in the 1980s. Each of these dots is a study, not a sheep is a study somewhere. And this shows in the last couple of weeks before lambing, if you want the, the user gain an allowance of two to three kilos, that's that blue circle, that's how much their total live weight change will be. We're around that 300 grams per day and you think that's a lot. But the fetus is genetically set up, each fetus to be growing 100 grams per day. So if there's two in there, like you, there's 200 grams per day just in fetus, let alone probably 50 to 100 grams in the associated fluids with the uh, water bag, et cetera. So that's the type they need. That's just for the ewe to meet her requirements and not have to use her fat. And, and, and again, here, looking at the post-grazing heights, that's why we talk about 1,200, is to get that 300 grams per day total live weight change. If you're grazing a lot lower, you can see she's only putting on 100 to 200 grams per day. But if there's two fetuses in there, the reality is what, what that means is those fetuses will still grow at that rate, plus or minus five or ten percent. That's all you change birth weight by, or by, by feeding is plus or minus five to ten percent. So she's actually getting thinner and thinner. And you all know that when ewes go down with sleepy and your dog tuck at them, they're just skin and bones, most of them. And that's because we've created this. And if you've got that low allowance of one and a half a day, she's actually losing weight. So it's set stocking, the last point I want to make about set stocking is that you won't have every paddock on your farm at 1,200 kilograms coming to lambing. But hopefully between now and lambing, your winter rotation order, because you want to be set in winter rotation order so that those paddocks you put your twin and triplet bearing first cycle lambing use in have had the most time to grow back. So so when you set to stock them, those paddocks will have the most amount of grass. So they should be the ones you graze first on your winter rotation and not go back to. And in terms of which paddocks are that? Now, most of you for many, many years will have been scanning. And most of you for even longer period than that will have been counting tails at docking. Because we all do that, right? We all count tails because we want to know how many lambs are in, the, were in that paddock. Now, if you've got scanning data where you know that in paddocks X, Y, and Z, you only put in... Uh, singles or twins or triplets, you therefore know how many lambs were in there. The paddocks were you put using, well, there'd only be one lamb in there per use, so you know how many lambs there should be there at weaning. The paddocks you put twins in, you know there should be two lambs and triplets three, and, and hopefully you have confidence in your scanner, you can say that. And then if you count the tails, you'll actually therefore get for each paddock over five or ten years, or groups of paddocks, actual lamb survival data because you know how many fetuses went in, you know how many lambs came out. Now that means for each paddock on your farm or groupings of paddocks on your farm, if you don't dock each paddock separately, you'll actually work out which of the paddocks on your farm have the, both, has the best lamb survival. And you may not know why that is. You might think, I don't understand that, but those paddocks always do. Well, the other ones you want to make sure have the highest cover coming into lambing and they're the ones that you would put your twin and triplet bearing using because that's where you're going to get your, your uh, best uh, bang for your buck in terms of lamb survival and lamb growth. So using that data that you've already had by years of counting tails and your winter rotation order, you should be setting your palms up now between now and set stocking so you put the right ewes in the right paddocks. Your late lambing ewes, they can be set stocked two to three weeks later and set stock then, you know, just on the drop because by then hopefully, you're, you know, those ewes are in third cycle or, or, the, or the second part of the second cycle, by the time they lamb, and by the time their late pregnancy occurs and they lamb, pasture's really coming away. 
So they're the paddocks that will be last in the rotation, that they should be lambing on. And of course, your single bearing uh, use. So thinking about your winter rotation, uh, order of paddocks, not just going from paddock A to B because it's the gate next door, putting a bit of extra work in in a year like this, in terms of, it might mean you actually have to move them two paddocks before, you know, walk them through two paddocks to get to the next paddock in the rotation, just so you get the setup order right, um, will have a big impact on the covers at lambing and the paddocks that you want the cover, because they're the paddocks you want your first cycle twin and triplet use lambing in to maximise the survival of those lambs, to maximise her milk production, and therefore the weight of those lambs at weaning, which is a big impact on your um, income because the heavier those lambs are, the uh, more likely they are going to achieve a slaughter weight early. So that's why you should be set stocking based on those uh, individual uh, U demands around pregnancy, rank, body condition, past cover and potential lamb survival. And in a perfect world, and, and I won't give you the number, of how many, what the stocking rate should be singles, twins or triplets, because it'll differ for every environment. But in a perfect world, it'll be occurring so that covers don't go below 1,200. Now, we don't live in a, a perfect world. So then you'll say, okay, Paul, that's just silly. It's unrealistic. So what would I do? Well, what you would try to do is to ensure your poor condition triplet and twin bearing ewes are set stocked in a rate in a paddock, which was grazed earlier in the rotation, which has higher covers, so hopefully, hopefully for the vast majority of lactation, the um, pasture covers that close to that 1,200 as a minimum. Whereas your later lambing, single bearing ewes, in, in, you know, in that group or groups, um, well, we'll just have to accept in a hard year that they're going to be pushed a bit harder and they're going to be able to cope with that a lot better than those other ewes. And therefore the impact on your overall uh, lamb survival of your flock and the overall weaning weights uh, is less impacted by putting those less demand use, those single bearing use, and those late lambing use into those paddocks with lower covers. And it's just prioritizing based on that because we can't live uh, in a situation where every paddock is going to be optimal because it just isn't going to be in any year, let alone in a year where the covers are low. So do, do we have any more questions, Greg? Yeah, look, Paul, there was, another, I guess we'll just go back to that one about the bearings and, and like I can't, I remember if you mentioned it or not, I'm busy making some notes as you were talking, uh, so I may have overlooked it. But the question there, in this perfect world in feeding, um, how many bearings would you expect in a normal flock, I guess? And, <laughs> you know, I guess what's an acceptable level? Well, well, all farmers will tell you zero is acceptable level because no one wants bearings. Um, that's, a, that's an impossible answer, you know, question to answer because, you know, as I said, those big studies went on and on some farms with many thousands of ewes, they had less than 1% one year, and then the next year they had 4 or 5%. Um, you know, you, you'd like to think it's in the 1% or 2%, Greg, but we just don't know the biology behind it. Every farmer has their own theory, and, and, and if, we are, if we did a quick survey now and asked each of the 28 or so farmers to, to, to say what causes burying, we'd probably end up with 20 different answers. We, we wouldn't finish on time either, Paul. No. Uh, but look, uh, just an observation. And, I, I, and whether... I'll, I'll put it this way, Greg. I would, in terms of number of lambs you wean and the weight of those lambs that wean, you'll do more damage by worrying about bearings and underfeeding than you will by uh, slowly increasing their feeding um, in late pregnancy to get towards the optimum. Because remember, if you've got a poor condition you, she's going to lose her lambs. So where's your income out of that? It's not out of wool unless you're the a merino farmer, um, especially if you've now shorn twice a year, it's not at all. Um, so what's the lesser of two evils? Yes, we see bearings. Yes, they're disgusting. Yes, they cause a lot of work, but use in poor condition, poorly fed, lambing on low covers results in dead lambs and light lambs. Okay. Okay, another question that I put up there, um, Paul, was uh, with respect to optimizing lamb weaning weight, live weight at, at, uh, at weaning, yep. Obviously, what gains can be realised, if any, from rotationally grazing ewes with lambs at foot? I, and, and really what I'm talking about there is, is from tailing onwards. That's right. There, there has been some work done uh, by, by AgriSearch um, down at Woodlands to show that, uh, that you can get a, you know, a couple of kilos extra wing weight uh, by rotational grazing. Um, this was done a while ago. 
Um, two things about that is it's post-tailing um, when the user lambs are quite mobile. It's about keeping the uh, herbage in that optimum window, so making sure it doesn't get above 1800 because then pasture starts to lose quality and doesn't get below 1200 because then you're starting to limit the intake post uh, tailing of both the ewe and your lambs. So it's about keeping that fresh pit. I would say though um, that those studies weren't done in massive mobs. So uh, you know, a, a mob of a couple of hundred ewes is a different uh, mob, so, you know, than of, of, of 100 ewes in terms of, because as you move them, there will be that separation of the ewes and lambs, and they will spend time re, rebonding up, et cetera, and they're not eating, et cetera. So that does work. You just need to be careful about very large mobs. Yeah, I so think might, um, where I've seen... To get the top thing. Yeah, uh, where I've noticed it, uh, Paul, working very well is where people have uh, a high level of subdivision and they are able to keep those mob size exactly. reasonably, reasonably yep. small. Um, uh, look, just uh, another question's come through and it's about um, seed stocking. I'm, I'm lambing about 1,500 ewes and still shed off. Should I pluck up the courage and seed stock? So I, I think what the, the person is saying is the traditional approach has been lambing the ewes and then walking off the, 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 the user lands post lambing. If, if that's working effectively, and, and if that's a mechanism for that farmer to ensure the user late pregnancy uh, get fed enough because he, he or she's got them on a, a restricted area with a lot of feed, well, I think you'd, you'd stick to that. Um, if, however, um, you've got no feed, um, walking them off from no feed to to, to no feed is, is not of an advantage at all. Um, you've just put, probably put them under more stress. So in, in, in that situation, I think you'd be better to set stock um, and the few paddocks you do have with good cover, target the, the um, multiple bearing poor condition use first, first cycle in those. Okay. Um, the same person's made a comment, take the unlambed views out. Oh, the other way around, walking off the unlambed use. Um, yep. So, so, so that's so. If you, if you mean if you're set stocking, um, and then if pasture covers are getting too low in the paddock, um, if you have the capability um, and you've got a nearby paddock, yes, walk, walking out the non-lambing use into another paddock does work. Yep, as as a means of reducing demand, and that'll it'll ensure that cover doesn't get too low or, or more quickly recovers, but. Just with any activity around lambing, you have to be accustomed to that human interaction and, and potentially dog interaction if you're using a dog quietly, because you don't want to cause more problems than you fix by causing the smothering. So that has been shown to be effective in very accustomed and quiet flocks as a way of reducing demand. But but then you'd ask the question, what? Um, I presume you're just moving into the paddock next door, which appears to have higher cover. So you're just balancing up. The, the, then that would work. Um, however, I wouldn't set aside a, a, a paddock with no sheep in it um, and then walk out into that because all you're doing by default by having no sheep in a paddock is increasing the demand for all the other sheep that are stuck in the paddocks with grass, uh, with, with animals, because you've, you know, if you moved all your animals into four paddocks rather than having them spread over five. So it just depends on why you're doing it and how you're doing it. Uh, another question, please, can you tell us current recommendations on pre lamb vaccinations and timing? So, it, so, so each, each product has a, actually a, a different uh, date period. So you need to check with what product you use. Some, some can be done many weeks before lambing, many, many weeks, and some within just two or three weeks before lambing. Um, so it, generally, it's most products in the two to three weeks before lambing is the minimum because you need enough time for the antibodies to build up and to get into the colostrum. So you don't want to leave it too late, say a week or so before lambing, because in those first cycle use, which are the majority of your use, 70 80% of your use, um, they won't have time for those antibodies to build up and to be in their colostrum. So most products that two to three weeks before lambing. But do check the product. Um, just wondering if there are a couple of other key points you want to um, get through. Um, and then um, I guess it's also, uh, I'm taking this opportunity to, um, to remind the audience that if they do have any questions, um, please get them in through the chat system now so that we can get them addressed over the next few minutes. 
So back to you, Paul. Um, two things. If you've got pregnant hoggets, remember you have to keep feeding them well because they're the ones I'd be more worried about underfeeding pregnant hoggets and then not growing uh, and then them being stunted for their lifetime. And, and we know that a, a lighter uh, animal going into a tutu with poor condition, her chances of being there at three or four years of age is 30% less. So if, for those of you that have bred hoggets, they're another priority class of animals through this period. I'm sorry to add to that. Um, but don't forget that because unlike your mature ewes, they're a teenager in human terms, they still need to physically grow. And that's the period. So in the first two thirds of gestation, feeding them well should be a priority. Um, no one asked about um, if I've got too many ewes, which ones to get rid of. Um, I would get rid of your single bearing ewes. Um, because a uh, single bearing ewe will never uh, rear as many kilos of lamb that year than a twin bearing ewe if you've feed enough to get both lambs alive or triple bearing ewe. So that would be the ones I target if you have to decrease. Um, and remember, genetically, a ewe that's um, single bearing versus a twin bearing ewe, genetically on average is less fertile or fecund. So therefore, chances of being twin or triple bearing in future years is less as well. So that would be the ones I would target if anyone's considering getting rid of animals. I think that's probably all, Greg. I've just had another question come through, Paul. Where would you rank pregnancy hoggets? Okay, so I would put pregnant hoggets um, behind your poor condition uh, first cycle multiples, then hoggets next. If, if talk, talking about the, that hierarchy I did, they're right up there. They're right up there. Um, and, and, and hopefully some of you have got some rain lately and hopefully it's warm and, and covers are, are starting to grow but the, the hogget um, is a real priority class really because remember not only she, you might think oh she's only carrying one lamb but it's the next she's your next five years and um, what you do to her in her first gestation has a huge impact on her performance over her first five years so she's right up at the top Okay, we've had another one come through. What are your thoughts on triplets? Rear on mother or rear at home and the advantages and disadvantages of that? Triplets, yes. Um, there is no doubt that lamb survival is poor on triplets and if your ewes are in poor condition, your covers are low, it'll be bad, real bad. You might be 30 to 40% death rates this year. Um, that, that, that's what we know it happens and with low pasture covers, thin triplet bearing ewes. So therefore, in that situation, if you have the time and the desire, um, well then rearing triplets um, artificially um, or mothering on is, is a means of getting your numbers of lambs up. Now, for most of you, if your ewes were in poor condition at breeding, your number of lambs you're going to wean this year is going to be down anyway because your reproductive performance, your scanning percentage is probably back a bit. So you want to get every lamb you can alive if you're going to have some lambs to sell this year. So... If, if you can, um, certainly getting them in, and it's the smallest lamb um, that has the lowest survival within the set based on a number of studies looking at where they've ranked the lambs based on the biggest, middle, or the smallest lamb uh, within a set. It's the smallest lamb that has the greatest uh, chance of death or probability of death. So that's the one um, I would take off. But again, like we talked about, the situation about uh, walking ewes and lambs post-lambing off, you ewes really do need to be accustomed to do that, so you trip the bearing use, you know, I'd land them closer to the facility where you're going to take those lambs, so you've got much distance to transport them, and a week or two before lambing, walk through those use a couple of times a day. You'll be surprised how quickly they quieten down. But it's an individual choice whether you have the time and the desire to, to uh, rear triplet lambs. Just to, to add to that um, very quickly, um, I know there are a number of people, in fact, there's somebody in the uh, audience today that uh, does, uh, does manage um, triplet bearing ewes, um, uh, I guess, housed, um, and uh, that being uh, Richard Dawkins. Um, look, I know we had a field day at his place a couple of years ago, and I, I just one of the, the key messages I learned from that was that in that situation, by taking those triplet bearing ewes uh, off the paddock and uh, lambing them um, undercover, if in effect what that was uh, uh, enabling was 
the set stocking rate on those higher risk uh, twin bearing ewes to be lower, meaning that it, um, there was a lower death rate in that, in that aspect of the flock. And those lambs are also heavier at weaning time as well. So I'm um, not sure if uh, Richard wants to join in and, and um, comment. Oh, I see he's just posted a, um, uh, a message to me. Over four years, we have halved triplet lamb death rates from 33% to 17%. So um, I'm sure there's some stuff on uh, Beef and Lamb's website that uh, we might be able to um, forward to you on that as well. He's also just noted that you deaths are down from 10% to 1.5%. So some massive gains from that system. Yeah, and I think as is the point I was trying to say with the bearings, Greg, I think we're underestimating how many of our lambs we don't have at weaning due to ewe deaths. And that's about poor feeding, um, poor condition ewes. You know, I'd be more worried about ewes dying that way than worrying about having to put a few ewes down with bearings in terms of what it does to your lambing percentage. Um, the other point I would make about, we've done some work and there's been other work done throughout New Zealand with artificial rearing lambs. You can wean them at as light as 18 kilos. So if you're going into rearing lambs, don't think I'm gonna to have to keep feeding the milk till they get to 30 bucks, how am I gonna make money out of that? But if you've got a type of herbage with a high uh, either clover content or a um, lucerne type herbage or a uh, herb, chicory, plantain, clover mix type stuff, you, um, early weaned lambs onto that, they can catch up pretty quick to being um, those that are, you know, that, that, that are twin bearing left for their mum. So, you know, you don't have to, if you're going to rear lambs, think you've got to rear lambs all the way through to 30 kilos. You can get them onto good quality feed and that might include some kind of nut because that aids with um, rumen development. So the earlier they're eating a, a, a nut uh, or pellet, that's quicker their rumen develops and quicker they'll start grazing and get, um, a high quality herbage. So, so quicker you can get them off the powder to reduce your costs. And again, Beef and Lamb has some information on that as well. Okay, look, um, we're going to wrap up now. And look, I just really want to take um, time to say uh, thank you very much to our audience for attending. I hope you've been able to um, to say, take something out of it. Look, I, I was going to provide a bit of a summary of, of the, the key messages that I thought, but it's, it's really going to take too long to go through them because I think there was a, a lot of them. Yeah, I, I guess uh, as um, Paul alluded to just there or, or reiterated there was... Um, Basically, it all comes down to feeding. And uh, if you want heavy lambs, we maybe have to take a leaf out of the dairy farmer book and, and focus on milk production uh, to achieve that. So look, thank you very much, Paul, for your contribution this afternoon. Um, once again, uh, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Um, it's been some really relevant and um, very interesting um, points raised. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, also, once again, thank you to Beef and Lamb through uh, the, the, the levies that you provide them for making um, this webinar available.